Hello, and welcome to Buffy and the Art of Story Season 2. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and you love creating stories, or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. I am Lisa M. Lilly, author of the Awakening Supernatural Thriller series and the QC Davis Mysteries, and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 20, Go Fish. In particular, we'll talk about how this episode treats disturbing issues as a joke, undercutting its lighthearted tone, as well as some of the most fun lines in Buffy to date, including Xander saying, oh, forgive me your swim teamliness. A twist at the midpoint that is especially fun and interesting, but major plot turns at unusual places that rob the episode, in my view, of a bit of its momentum and make it feel uneven. As always, there will be no spoilers except at the end to talk about foreshadowing, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Go Fish was written by Ellen Hampton and David Fury and directed by David Semmel. Before I go into the breakdown, when I said last Monday that we were coming up to Go Fish, a fun episode, I had forgotten the troubling aspects of it, which are that both threatened and actual sexual assault and rape are treated lightly and played for jokes. There's nothing graphic here in my breakdown or in the episode itself, but I am flat these issues in case it's something that you don't want to encounter as you listen to this episode and perhaps like me you had forgotten that aspect of the episode. We start out for a change not with conflict but with a very peaceful scene. A shot of the ocean, it is rolling, uh, we see lovely waves and there is really nice music in the background. Then we get our opening conflict. Xander, Willow, and Cordelia are standing on the beach, and Xander says what a stupid idea it is to have a party on the beach when it's this cold. And also he says the swim team is not a real team. But Cordelia says it's about time the school excelled at something. To which Willow responds, you're forgetting our high mortality rate. So what a nice quick opening conflict. We also see on the beach there's bonfires, there's lots of students around. So now we know it's a celebration for the swim team, that it is apparently the first team that is winning anything at Sunnydale in quite some time. And Willow quickly reminds us how many people die in Sunnydale. Buffy, however, is not with her friends. She is sitting on the beach looking out at the ocean. A swim team member, and by the way, it's the boys' swim team, will find out his name is Cameron. He walks over and he says something about how beautiful the ocean is and and how it's eternal. Buffy jokes something like she was just thinking that it was big. He laughs and she asks what he's going to do now that he has had this big win. He says he wants to spend some time hanging out with her. Someone calls out for help from behind them. Jonathan is being dunked into a tub of water by another swim team member. Buffy runs over, pulls the swim team guy off of Jonathan, and Cameron says his teammate had it coming. So at first, I am sort of liking Cameron. He clearly likes Buffy. He laughs at her jokes. He's a little annoying with his profound comments about the ocean, but he doesn't seem to approve of his teammates bullying and so uh, he seems like a reasonably okay guy. Jonathan though is mad. He tells Buffy he could have handled this without her help and he says mind your own business and stalks off. Buffy turns to Cameron and says see it's fun to hang out with me. Our unnamed bully and another swimmer we find out is named Gage take a walk on the beach. The bully complains about Buffy. He can't believe her. 
He falls behind Gage, who doesn't notice at first, but he does notice that something smells terrible. He looks around, and at 4 minutes, 35 seconds into the episode, the camera pans to skin the pieces on the beach, like skin and steaming flesh. And then there is a shot of a sea creature in what looks like a giant storm drain. And we go to credits. So that was our story, Spark or Inciting Incident, which typically happens about 10% into any story. So here it is right on time at 4 minutes 35 seconds in. It is uh, about a 42-minute episode. And it's a great hook, no pun intended, given all the fish puns that we're going to have right before the commercial or uh, rather the credits. When we return, Willow is teaching the computer class and she walks through the room looking at the students' efforts and their screens and telling them they are doing good pie charts until she gets to Gage. Willow says, your pie chart is looking a lot like solitaire with naked ladies on the cards. And Gage says, what's your point? The bell rings. Principal Snyder comes in as the class leaves. He tells Willow the board wants her to continue teaching the rest of the semester. They're having trouble finding a substitute to replace Miss Calendar. I mentioned in a previous episode how only in Sunnydale would a student be asked to take over and teach a class. I have to wonder if some of that is that high death rate Willow mentioned. Perhaps substitutes are not too eager to come to Sunnydale. Willow, though, is excited. She says how much she likes teaching. And Snyder says he's glad she's a team player. And he understands that there's a problem with Gage. Willow is relieved that he knows. She mentions behavior issues. And he doesn't do the work. And his test scores, well, there aren't any test scores because he doesn't take the tests. But Snyder's not interested in any of that. He's concerned that she's slapping a failing mark on a student on a winning team and that that would disqualify Gage from swimming. Willow says she's trying to be fair. Snyder points out that Gage is a champion. He's under a lot of pressure. Willow says, you're asking me to change his grade? Snyder claims he never said that. He just said that he thinks if she reviews her figures, she'll find something more appropriate for Gage in the area of a D. In the hall later, Xander is appalled. He says that's a slap in the face to everyone who worked hard for their Ds. But Cordelia says winners deserve more. That's how the world works. Xander's mad that Buffy's not there to share his outrage about swim team perks because she's too busy being one of them. We switch to Buffy and Cameron. They're sitting in his car talking, or rather Cameron is talking, in the school parking lot. He waxes eloquent about swimming and philosophy. She interrupts and thanks him, saying with a little bit of sarcasm, I forgot how nice it is to just talk, or in my case listen, without any romantic pressure. Cameron assures her he's not about pressure, but then he turns on a dime and asks if she's wearing a bra. When she reacts badly, he locks her car door and says relax I'm not going to hurt you and Buffy in a line that I love says oh it's not me I'm worried about he says you like it rough and lunges for her she grabs him and bangs his face into the steering wheel he yells out says you broke my nose all this as Snyder passes the car he stares through the windshield at both of them of course he has only seen the part where Buffy bangs Cameron's nose into the steering wheel. About 10 minutes in, in the nurse's office, the nurse gives Cameron an ice pack. Buffy tells Snyder she wasn't the attacker, she was attacked. So at least Buffy points out that this was an attempted sexual assault. Though later, she'll uh, seem to be convinced by the reaction of her friends, no less, that it was really no big deal. Snyder says that's not how it looked to him, and Cameron claims that Buffy led him on and then went schizo. And she says, what do you mean led you on? And he says, look at the way she dresses. 
The coach comes in. He's relieved that Cameron's nose is not broken because he needs Cam to win the championship, especially with Dodd gone. We're nearing the one-quarter twist, which should come in a well-structured story from outside the protagonist and take the story in a new direction. Here, I am uncertain exactly where this happens or what point it's at, but right now we're about 10 minutes, 45 seconds into the episode. So timing-wise, we're at the one-quarter point, and Buffy asks, what happened to Dodd? Snyder tells her it's none of her concern. The coach tells Cameron to go take a steam, clear his nasal passages, and tells the nurse to take good care of him. He then turns to Buffy and says, and you, try to dress more appropriately from now on. This isn't a dance club. So on two levels, this is awful of the coach. First, and most important, it doesn't matter how she dresses. It is not okay what Cameron did. Second, she doesn't look dressed for a dance club. She's pretty much wearing just regular clothes anyone might wear to school. The way Buffy is dressed suggests to me that the writers are trying to point out that this is awful. This blaming of girls for how boys act. On the other hand, and the way that she's dressed suggests maybe if she were dressed differently, it would be okay. I don't think that is the writer's intent. I, I think that they are trying to show that the coach is a jerk, as is Cam, and that a girl should not be blamed. So the issue I have with how this plays out is really in the next scene. Side note, when I went to high school, uh, that is totally how that kind of thing would have been treated. It would definitely be blamed on the girl. Probably also true in the late 90s when Buffy was made. I hope not true now. So we switch to the library. Buffy is telling about what happened to Giles, Xander, Willow, and Cordelia. They have books all over the library table, clearly in the middle of researching something important. Buffy winds up by saying, I'm treated like the baddie. And she says just because Cameron has a sprained wrist and a bloody nose and she doesn't have a scratch on her, which she says she admits does hurt her case a little, but he gets away with it just because he's on the swim team. And in case they haven't noticed, those guys get away with all kinds of things. The others have no patience with her as they have noticed that and she hasn't until now. At least that's the implication based on what we have heard before. Buffy realizes that they are just staring at her in stony silence and says, enough about her, what's happening with them? And Giles says, thank you for taking an interest. If the incident that Buffy was complaining about were something else, I don't know what that would be, but not sexual assault. And she was going on and on about how unfair it was, the way the team got away with things, and the group reacted that way. That would work really well for me because they uh, have been researching and working hard. They have all noticed the perks for the swim team and Buffy missed it because she was dating one of them. The problem I have with the scene is that she was, it was an attempted sexual assault. You could argue that Buffy wasn't in any real danger. So that's why they're ignoring that aspect of it. And she was in far more danger in season one when Xander tried to assault her because he was possessed by a hyena and had super strength. I feel like that was different though because at that point everyone was starting to suspect there was something wrong with Xander, that he'd been possessed. So it put that fight between Buffy and Xander more into the realm of what Buffy deals with all the time. Demons and vampires trying to attack her and assault her one way or another. Here we're talking about an experience she had with a boy she was dating. So I I am disappointed that the writers wrote this such that the characters seem to be saying, well, Buffy, you're so self-absorbed going on and on about being assaulted when we're upset that the swim team, I don't know, gets better grades. I don't in any way think the writers intended that. I feel like it is a result partly of the time in which it was written and how such things were treated then. But it is a good example of why it's important to step back and consider the subtext 
of what you are writing. See whether there are messages woven in there that you are not intending to be there. At about 11 minutes 40 seconds in, the others tell Buffy that human remains were found on the beach and they were Dodds, but it is not a vampire because he was eviscerated. Xander says, in other words, this was no boating accident. That's a line from Jaws, the movie, and harkens back to Killed by Death, where we also had movie references. Also from Xander, so he seems to be the one who spends a lot of time watching old movies. The group talks about how they are looking for a demon that eats a human whole except for the skin. Buffy says that doesn't make sense. Xander says, yeah, the skin's the best part. To which Buffy responds, any demons with high cholesterol? Giles gives her a look and she says, you're going to think about that later, mister, and you're going to laugh. I see the part about finding the human remains on the beach and that they are Dodds as the one quarter twist here. It is what takes the story in a new direction. Even though as an audience member, we already knew all of this. We knew it was Dodd on the beach. We didn't know his name, but we knew a swimmer on the beach that there was just skin left and that there was some kind of monster that was not a vampire. However, Buffy didn't know this. So this does change her direction and sets her and her friends off to find out what's happening. The next scene is in the the locker room. Cameron sits in the steam room and like all Sunnydale locker rooms everything is dim and in shadow. We see an ominous shadow approach the steam room but it's just the coach coming in to tell Cameron he's had enough and he should hit the shower. Xander's heading to the vending machine for soda. Cameron exits the locker room and bumps into him. He yells at Xander for getting in his way, and Xander says, oh, forgive me your swim teamliness. He then taunts Cameron about Buffy, almost breaking his nose. Cameron ignores him. He's heading to the cafeteria because he's hungry. Xander says, oh, too bad, the cafeteria's closed. But Cameron says, not for me. In the lunchroom, Cameron sniffs and says, God, what is that? From the hallway, Xander hears Cameron screaming. Xander runs in and sees overturned tables and then clothes and skin on the floor. Xander turns away, about to vomit, and sees one of these sea monsters. This is at 15 minutes, 15 seconds in. So it's pretty soon after that one quarter major plot turn, yet it feels like it should be either that first major turn because we find out, okay, it's a sea monster, or like it should be the last major plot turn that explains things. Because we know, I should say, not just the sea monster, but that it is particularly after swim team members. But instead, this happens between our one quarter and halfway points. This is part of what feels a bit uneven to me about the plot here. In the library, Xander describes the monster and Cordelia tries to draw it. She produces a pretty good likeness, which makes me wonder, is everyone in Sunnydale good at drawing? Because we saw Angel is really a pretty good artist. Of course, he's had hundreds of years to practice. Willow and Buffy come in. Willow says Buffy was right. Dodd and Cameron were the first and second best swimmers on the team. Buffy says that makes Gage next because he's the third best swimmer. And Cordelia says, God, this is so sad. We're never going to win the state championship. Giles thinks these may be revenge killings against the swim team, so they talk about who hates the team members. Willow reminds them the team bullied Jonathan. So Buffy tells her to go question him, and Willow's really excited about getting to take that interrogator role. Giles tells Buffy Gage might benefit from her protection. She should discreetly watch him. So now we're getting to what I find to be one of the most fun parts of the episode, Buffy trying and failing miserably to be surreptitious. In the student lounge area, she 
watches Gage. He's sitting about 10 feet from her reading and he looks over at her and she is so obviously watching him and she jerks her head back to her magazine. In a classroom that's otherwise empty, Willow shines a light in Jonathan's face. She's standing, he's sitting, she acts like a detective in an old-fashioned movie as she questions him about the team. He says he couldn't be on it because he's asthmatic. She interrogates him until he admits that that bothered him and he hated the way the team members pushed him around. Willow says, so you wanted revenge, didn't you? Didn't you? Jonathan finally says yes. And Willow says, so you delved into the black arts and conjured a hell beast from the ocean's depth to wreak your vengeance, didn't you? And Jonathan says, no, I snuck in yesterday and peed in the pool. We switch to the coach and Principal Snyder. They're talking about the team. The coach says the rest of the team members will figure out what's happening. Snyder reassures the coach that he feels their pain and he says, I don't know finer boys than Cameron and that other one, but he's sure those boys would want the team to carry on competing and win the championship. But the coach says they can't even compete unless they get another swimmer by today's tryouts. Snyder thinks that's no big deal. All the person has to do is wear a bathing suit. Xander, who was sitting at a nearby table with his back to the audience, turns around. At 19 minutes in, we get more Buffy and Gage. They're at the bronze. Gage is playing pool by himself. Buffy watches him from the bar and then attempts to casually saunter closer. Gage walks over and stands right in front of her. He tells her the me and my shadow act is getting old and what does she want? Buffy claims to be a swim team groupie. Gage is skeptical. Buffy says, oh yeah, you know, there's just something about the smell of chlorine on a guy. Oh baby. Gage rolls his eyes, as he should, and walks away, and Buffy runs after him. Today's show is sponsored by writingasasecondcareer.com. There you can find articles about writing, marketing, publishing, and time management for writers, especially for writers who are working full-time at another career or who have other significant responsibilities. You can also find books on writing, including Super Simple Story Structure, A Quick Guide to Plotting and Writing Your Novel, Happiness, anxiety and writing using your creativity to live a calmer happier life the one-year novelist creating compelling characters from the inside out and of course Buffy and the Art of Story season one writing better fiction by watching Buffy We are now very close to the midpoint where usually we see a commitment by the protagonist to the quest, a reversal, or both. Here, first we get a commitment. It is not quite as extreme as we sometimes see in the show, but Buffy does, to some extent, throw caution to the wind, go all in, and just tell Gage what's going on. And I see it as a commitment because usually Buffy uh, is trying to maintain maintain something of her secret identity. She is uh, usually not telling people, hey, there's a vampire after you. She's just protecting them. But here she says to Gage, okay, okay, obviously my sex appeal is on the fritz today, so I'll just give it to you straight. She then tells him something is out there killing people, and she thinks that he's next. But he tells her she's twisted and says, Cam told me about your games. Gage leaves, and as he walks out of the bronze, he mutters under his breath about that bitch. Angel emerges from the shadows and says, you gotta be talking about Buffy. Gage asks how he knows, and Angel says, he sort of had a thing with her for a while. Gage says, my condolences, dude. Angel pretends to commiserate with Gage. He says Buffy needs someone to knock her down. Gage says that would be sweet, and does he have anyone in mind? Angel goes into vamp face and says, you're in luck, my friend. It just so happens I'm recruiting. So now we get what looks like a midpoint reversal. It happens right at 21 minutes, 
10 seconds in. And this episode is just over 42 minutes. So we are almost exactly at that midpoint. And it looks like Angel attacks Gage. It looks like he's going to die. And that will be this major reversal for Buffy, who was there specifically to protect Gage. But we get a twist. And I really enjoy this because it is a surprise. Buffy comes out. She hears Gage screaming for her and runs to him, but Angel has already backed off and he is spitting out Gage's blood. We then get a fun moment. Buffy has her hair up and she pulls out a giant hairpin and threatens Angel with it. Her hair falls beautifully all around her shoulders and Angel parodies one of those moments in the old movies where suddenly this woman who was supposedly dowdy because she wore glasses and her hair up, lets her hair down, and the hero just realizes how beautiful she is. And Angel says, why Miss Summers, you're beautiful. He grabs Gage again, throws him aside, and stalks off. I really enjoy this fake out with the reversal, and I think that it makes that otherwise not super strong midpoint really work. Gage asks Buffy if that was the thing that killed Cameron. She says no, it was something else, And unfortunately, we have a lot of something else's in this town. She starts to leave, but Gage asks her to walk him home. At swim practice the next day, Buffy's there with Cordelia and Willow so she can keep an eye on Gage. All the swimmers wear yellow caps and goggles. It's hard to tell them apart, but Gage pauses in the middle of his lap to stop and wave to Buffy. The three girls talk about Angel spitting out the blood and speculate that he didn't like something in it, maybe steroids. But Cordelia is distracted by a swimmer who walks in and she says, says, oh, oh my, now that girl's is my kind of. And the camera shows the new swimmer starting with his feet and panning up his very well-muscled legs. And Willow says, Xander? And Cordelia says, Xander. She goes over to him and yells at him that he has to leave because he doesn't belong there and they're going to throw him out. But he says he's undercover and Buffy kind of smirks and says, not under much. He tells them he tried out last night and made the team so he can keep an eye on Gage when Buffy can't. Very eagerly, Willow says, when you're nude? Buffy nudges her from behind and she says, I meant when you're changing? The coach calls Xander over to the rest to the team and Cordelia says I'm dating a swimmer from the Sunnydale High swim team. Buffy asks Willow about Jonathan and whether he was involved and Willow says oh no he just sort of peed in the pool. Buffy says oh Xander dives into the pool and Buffy says oh At almost 25 minutes in, Xander is in the steam room asking the other guys why they like the steam so much. In the locker room, there is a grate over a large vent and the grate starts to move. Buffy paces outside the locker room. Xander comes out. He says Gage is right behind him putting on his sneakers, but it's not the Velcro kind, so give him a couple extra minutes. And then he says to Buffy, tag, you're it. In the dim locker room, Gage is in fact tying his shoes. He sniffs as if he smells something bad and then smells both his armpits, then takes a walk around the lockers, apparently looking for the source of the smell. From out in the hall, Buffy hears him screaming her name. She runs in and a sea monster is confronting Gage. Before the monster touches him though Gage falls on the floor in terrible pain and his skin splits open and he emerges as another sea monster and we cut to the commercial that happened about 26 minutes 48 seconds in it's another example of a really major shift in the story now we know it is not some monster coming after the swimmers they are turning into monsters that feels like it should be a major plot turn in most well-structured stories our most major turns are at that one quarter halfway and three quarter mark and 
this is kind of in between the halfway and the three quarter. So it's not that you can't have other major turns. That can be a really interesting thing in a story and you want various turns throughout to keep ratcheting up the tension. But when you have such significant ones at these kind of odd places, it can rob the one quarter and halfway and three quarter point of their power and make the narrative feel a little uneven. That's my view. I didn't know before I rewatched and looked at it for this that this is how the major turns played out. But I really think it might be part of why this episode is never a fan favorite and why it's always one that I think oh okay go fish you know I'll I'll watch it but I don't feel super excited about it. Buffy fights off the two sea monsters. They dive in through the grate, which apparently leads somehow into those giant tunnels below that are filled with water. I guess storm drains throughout the episode. It'll be a little bit unclear why we have big grates and later a trapdoor in the school that just lead right directly to these drains or whatever it is of, of water. In the nurse's office, the nurse has been bandaged Buffy's arm. Giles tells the coach the good news is none of his team actually died. Buffy tells him the bad news is their monsters. Not much of this episode contributes to the season or series arc. In fact, I don't think any of it does, but it is interesting. There is a little bit of a development here in that we see that in Sunnydale, people no longer seem surprised about monsters and these hellmouthy kind of things happening. They may not know about the hellmouth, but they know Sunnydale is a strange town. Giles and Buffy don't have to do anything special to make the case to the coach that his players have turned into monsters. The coach says, sadly, he doesn't know how this happened. He worked so hard. He hoped he was inspiring the team to greatness. And maybe he was afraid to ask if they might be taking anything to help them along. Buffy looks suspicious of the coach claiming innocence. In the next scene, Willow looks at school records on the computer. She says, says that members of the team had fractures, depression, and other issues linked to steroid abuse. And Xander says, but is steroid abuse usually linked to, hey, I'm a fish? Willow says there must be something else involved along with the steroids. Buffy suspects the nurse has something to do with this because she treated everyone on the team. She tells Xander to try to find out what the team is taking and how they're taking it. This scene is about 29 and a half minutes in and it adds to my feeling that the sea monster from within reveal should have been a major plot turn because it does send them in a totally new direction, that they are looking for some kind of steroid or other substance the team is taking, that is turning them into monsters. So yes, they were already speculating about steroids because of uh, Angel spitting out the blood, but now they know that it is something altering these guys' DNA. Buffy and Giles go into those watery tunnels with a tranquilizer gun to try to find the sea monsters and a sea monster follows them but they don't notice and that's all that happens with that scene there's no follow-up with them uh, later hunting or shooting any of the monsters it's a quick short scene that shows our heroes following up on a lead doing something that we would expect them to do and sometimes in a mystery or a thriller your protagonist is going to follow leads that don't go anywhere you You need that to happen or it would be obvious, too obvious what would happen. There would be no suspense. So I like that it does this quickly and it's a good example of how to do that in your story. On the other hand, this doesn't really feel that much like a whodunit episode and the scene really doesn't go anywhere. So I'm not sure that it adds anything here. At about 30 minutes, 30 seconds in, 
Xander is back in the steam room. He tries hinting around about ways to improve performance, saying he drank carrot juice, hoping someone will volunteer something. Finally, though, he just outright asks, when do they get their next dose and who's carrying? The other guys laugh about aromatherapy and tell him it's in the steam. We switch to the nurse. She is arguing with the coach in an area near the swimming pool. She wants to stop whatever they're doing. He calls her a quitter and says they just need to perfect the formula. But she says they already lost three team members. The coach, though, tells her they're not lost. And he throws her through a trapdoor into the water below. It's about waist deep. So this is what I mean about it's really unclear. Why is there a trap? door somewhere near the swim room that just leads down into this water that's, I don't know, just under the school. Anyway, I know it's not meant to be a serious episode, so maybe it doesn't matter, but I do think it adds to making this episode a a little bit muddled. The coach is looking down at her through the trap door, and he tells her he's still looking after his boys, and they're still a team, and the team's gotta eat. And he watches above as the sea monsters attack the nurse. And we cut to a commercial. The attack on the nurse happened at 32 minutes, 45 seconds in. So it is time-wise the three-quarter mark in the episode, which is part of why I say there isn't a lot of momentum with the three-quarter turn, because while throwing the nurse to his team is a pretty major thing to do, and if you're the nurse, it's horrible. And it is a reveal to the audience, both that the two of them were in on what was happening with the team and that the coach has no problem killing the nurse. It doesn't really spin the story. Also, our three-quarter turn should grow out of the midpoint in addition to turning the story in another new direction. And here, it really doesn't do that. Buffy doesn't find out about the nurse until much later, too late to affect the plot. In contrast, Xander learning about the steam does arise out of Buffy's action at the midpoint because that's when she told Gage the truth, which led him to ask for her protection after Angel attacked him. And that is part of what leads Xander to joining the team and learning about the steam. So it's a bit indirect, but it does come out of that. And the knowledge about the steam does propel the plot in a different direction. So I think that quieter moment of Xander learning that is actually the three quarter turn here. Xander is in a panic. Buffy tries to reassure him. She says, I wouldn't break out the tartar sauce yet. You were only exposed once twice and Xander says three times a fish guy this is a play on the song three times a lady I put a link to a performance of it on YouTube in the show notes just for fun it was kind of neat to revisit it and if you have never heard the song it's worth a listen Xander continues to panic saying what is he going to do and Cordelia says you 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 what about me and she says it's one thing to date a loser and another to date the creature from the blue lagoon Xander, really irritated, tells her that's Brooke Shields, another movie reference, and that she means the creature from the Black Lagoon. Buffy says they better lock up the rest of the swim team before they get in touch with their inner halibut. She then goes to the coach to find out what's going on, and she gets right to the point and says what's in the steam. The coach is surprisingly open about it, and he tells her that after the Soviet Union fell, documents became available showing that the reason their swimmers had won so many swim meets and championships was that they were taking a combination of steroids and shark fins and other ingredients, but no one could figure out the exact formula. Now he has almost cracked it. He is shocked when Buffy asks why he would do that and he says for the win. She tells him there isn't going to be a win because there isn't going to be a team. 
And doesn't he care what happens to the team members? Coach says, boy, when they were handing out school spirit, you didn't even stand in line, did you? Buffy responds, no, I was in the line for shred of sanity. The coach pulls a gun on her and she says, which you obviously skipped. Now it's clear why he didn't mind telling her what he was doing because he tells her to jump into that hole, that open trap door where he threw the nurse. She jumps down into to the water. He tells her his boys count on him and she sees the nurse's bitten up body and says so you're going to feed me to them? And now we are coming to the second example of the episode treating the threat of sexual assault lightly because the coach says they've already eaten but boys have other needs. Cordelia and Xander are walking near the pool. Xander keeps feeling his neck and asking if it looks scaly. Cordelia tells him, of course it does because of the way he keeps rubbing it. Xander says he needs to go take a look in the mirror and uh, she should come into the locker room if he screams. A moment later, Cordelia hears someone enter the pool area behind her. She jokes, any gills yet? Whoever it is dives into the pool. Cordelia turns around and sees a sea monster swimming underwater. As it goes across the pool, she crouches at the edge talking to it. She says, it's all her fault. She knows he joined the swim team just to impress her. She reassures Xander she still cares about him. And they can still date or not. She understands if he wants to see other fish. And she says she'll do everything she can to make his quality of life better, including bath toys. Xander startles her by walking up behind her and saying, that's not me. In the library, Giles herds the team into the book cage. He tries to reassure him, but he uh, kind of runs out of things to say because he says, either we'll find an antidote or um, stay calm. And he walks away. Xander and Cordelia come in as Willow is checking off the last of the team members' names. She says that Sean is missing. Cordelia and Xander say they found him, and Cordelia adds, he was in the pool skinless dipping. We switch to Buffy in the water, and she says in another disturbing line, great, this is just what my reputation needs, that I did it with the entire swim team. We're now at the climax, uh, almost 40 minutes in. Xander comes to see the coach, and he asks what's up, trying to be casual, but he is looking for Buffy. He sees the coach's gun lying there. Below, Buffy fights the sea monsters underwater. Above, Xander punches the coach. Buffy is surrounded. Xander yells down to her, reaches down, stretching his arm. Buffy goes into a crouch underwater and shoots up out of the water. She grabs Xander's arm. She's kicking the creatures away from her. She climbs out with Xander's help. The coach, though, has recovered somewhat. He lunges for both of them. They dodge and he flips over into the hole. Buffy grabs his arm and tries to hold him up out of the water, but he lets go. She yells down at him to grab her hand. The coach, though, is trying to talk to his team, saying, boys, boys, but they close in on him and attack. This resolution reminds me of The Witch, where Amy's mom was a human being who was a serious threat both to Amy and to Buffy. Buffy stopped her, But she didn't kill her. She reflected the spell that Amy's mom had cast back on her. And it was uh, poetic justice. Here, similarly, the coach meets the same fate he meant for Buffy. So again, it's poetic justice. Also, she tried to save him. His own hubris in believing he didn't need her help and that he could control his team is what killed him and his attack on Buffy, not Buffy herself. So as in The Witch, again, we see that Buffy does not kill humans. And in fact, even if they do evil things, we see here that she still tries to save them. Now we're in our falling action, which is where we resolve the loose ends and tie up any subplot. So first we get the last of our disturbing sexual assault jokes that also makes clear what happens to the coach because Buffy and Xander are looking down through that trap door and Buffy says those boys really love their coach. 
In the next scene, everyone is sitting in the student lounge area. Xander says he and the team are getting plasma transfusions. So we know they are going to be saved from turning into sea monsters. Cordelia tells Xander that he really proved himself to her. And she reassures him he doesn't have to join the new swim team because I'd be just as happy if you played football. Giles says animal control just left and the creatures disappeared. Willow asks if they need to hunt them, but Buffy says no, she thinks they won't bother anyone. Giles asks where she thinks they went and she says home. In the last scene, we see the sea creatures diving into the ocean. That is the end of the episode. In addition to thinking that if it were written today, we we would not get those sexual assault references and it wouldn't be part of the plot, or at least it would be treated very differently if it were. I also think today you would not see the coach pulling a gun on a student. You wouldn't see the gun at all. As Buffy goes on, we'll see guns become less and less common. I'm pretty sure we have seen them more in season one and two than we will in the entire other five seasons of Buffy. Another thing to note about this episode is not only is Oz not in it, he isn't mentioned. This really was a a self-contained one-off episode. It was meant to be watched in any order. You didn't need to know about Willow and Oz. If you watched it before Halloween or before Phases, it wouldn't spoil anything. You wouldn't know that Willow had a boyfriend and that the boyfriend was a werewolf. It also, I think, is because we want that little bit of tension, sexual tension between Xander and Willow. As always, more on Willow's side, but I think the writers probably wanted to be free to throw that in without having to deal with that Willow has a boyfriend now. It is a little inconsistent with the season arc, though I am willing to go with it because I think Willow, I feel like she's written to always have that little bit of feeling for Xander no matter what else is going on at least at this point in the show. That is it for this episode other than spoilers. If you are not sticking around for that thank you so much for listening. I hope you will come back next Monday for part one of Becoming the season finale. The following Monday of course I will cover part two of Becoming and the next week will be a season two roundup. If you have thoughts about season two as a whole, about Buffy generally, or anything else writing related, please feel free to email me, lisa at lisalilly, that's L-I-L-L-Y dot com, or tweet me at Lisa M as in Marie Lilly, hashtag Buffy story. And we are back for spoilers. First, Buffy and Undercover. In the pilot of season three, Buffy will recognize that she is just terrible at Undercover. So she's not just having an off day, as she suggests here when she's talking to Gage. She is just bad at it. In that pilot, she goes to a youth outreach center where she suspects bad things are happening. And at first, she tries to pretend she needs help. And she says something like, oh, yeah, I'm all about the sin and the rock music. And then she just gives up and says uh, something like, I suck it undercover and just busts into the place. Another major foreshadowing here is Jonathan both being, I guess there's three things, being bullied, getting mad at Buffy for helping, and then this petty revenge he takes. And this foreshadows a number of series developments. In season three, we'll see Earshot where Jonathan, near the end, he has got a rifle, he's in a tower, and it is largely because he is always being bullied or ignored. His revenge hints at what may happen in season six when he becomes one of the villains. And I wonder if Willow's comment about him summoning, going to the dark arts, summoning a hell beast, does that give Jonathan some ideas? 
ideas because later in the series we will see him using dark magic first in Superstar to um, make everyone think that he is amazing and then in season six when he becomes one of our villains. I do like that there is this little interaction between Willow and Jonathan that seems like a throwaway but that really could be sowing the seeds for Jonathan starting to think huh maybe there's a better way to get revenge than peeing in the pool. I feel like Jonathan, I think I've said this before, is one of uh, the great character arcs in Buffy and a terrific example of a character who at first just had walk-on roles and they wanted to bring the actor back. So they kept often making him the victim and then you can see how they decided to take all of that and turn it into a great backstory for a character who does these much more significant things. And almost all of that is hinted at here. I don't think at this point they had a plan for Jonathan. I do think that there was a plan for the Willow Cordelia Xander relationship because it's so interesting here in this lighthearted episode. We have that line where Cordelia's uh, Xander walks in to the swimming pool and we have to just kind of go with the idea that none of them recognized him at first. And Cordelia says something like, oh my, that's my kind of and Willow says Xander she cuts off Cordelia when she's saying my and Willow jumps in there and to me this foreshadows that ongoing issue with this attraction that Willow has for Xander there is also Cordelia foreshadowing because uh two things her soliloquy at the pool to sea monster Xander she thinks it's sea monster Xander it's silly and funny but it also shows that Cordelia has a depth of feeling for Xander so when he betrays her that is truly awful for her and in the falling action we see that despite that depth of feeling and that she was willing to go against her friends and public opinion and her own view of kind of who she should be dating, who matches her in status, she would really like it if Xander would join the swim team again or would play football, would do things that would bring him kind of to her social level. So then in season three, added to her hurt over the betrayal is that she went against her friends, her ideas of social class. And while I don't necessarily think at that point that that is what is at the heart of her pain, it does make it worse for her because her friends do not let her forget that she kind of lowered herself socially in their eyes to to date Xander and they mock her mercilessly about it. And that leads to the wish where she makes a wish and the vengeance demon grants it. And we get one of my favorite Buffy episodes. So I do think that all of that probably is intentionally foreshadowed here. That is it for spoilers and uh, for this episode. Thank you again for listening. And I hope you will come back next Monday for Becoming Part 1. Music for this episode was composed and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman LLC, copyright 2020.